what we are seeing are not monsters from a science fiction film, but certain images from the fantastic world of Maurits Cornelius Escher. Today, Escher is one of the most popular artists in the world. His works are to be found everywhere, but this is a fairly recent phenomenon, which exploded shortly before his death. Before looking at the structure, mathematical or otherwise, of Escher's works, it's worthwhile asking who Escher was. What kind of person was he? Escher lived in Italy for many years, as we are told by his friend Bruno Ernst. It is eigenlijk alsof Escher voortaan nooit meer iets anders zal doen dan in Italië wonen. Hij leert perfect Italiaans. It seems that he will stay in Italy for his whole life. He learns to speak perfect Italian. His children go to Italian schools, and he likes to be Italian with the Italians. But this seemed to be a little difficult, for Escher had light hair and blue eyes, which is typical for northern people and not for Italians. It happened in 1929 that he arrived late in the evening in Castrovalva in the Abruzzi with the purpose of making landscape sketches. There was a procession by the people of Castrovalva, and of course he did not join it. A woman went to the police and said that she saw somebody who looked strange. Next morning, Escher was woken up very early by the police. He went to the police station and asked angrily the reason for all this trouble. The day before, there had been an attack on the King of Italy in Torino, and now they suspected that Escher was one of the bandits. Escher remained in the police station for many hours. So, to be Italian with the Italians remained a little difficult. During his long stay in Italy, Escher was attracted mainly by the light, by the southern sun, by the landscape and the sea. But Escher's Italy is still a Mediterranean country seen through the eyes of a man of the north, a man who has never forgotten the world from which he has come. Escher's Italy becomes a strange country, imaginary, magical, full of wonderful creatures.
at the same time, what attracted Escher more than anything else was the rigidly geometric structure he discovered in the towns, the mountains and the landscapes. He was interested in the light and the rigidly geometric structure. His landscapes are the product of his imagination and of a strict and meticulous geometric construction. In 1935, Escher left Italy and after various voyages through Europe, he reached Spain. In Spain, he discovered the Arabian mosaics of the Alhambra in Granada. was an important turn in his life, as we hear from the crystallographer Caroline McGillivray, who wrote a famous book on symmetry with He Escher. made various sketches of these mosaics, and you can see that he studied them carefully. You know that there are some that are rather simple, others that are very complicated, really saw that there was something special about these mosaics, that you can figure, for example, that you turn the, the whole figure around this point and you see four times exactly the same thing. This set him to thinking about symmetry. This is what mathematicians call symmetry of a figure and set him thinking about this aspect, which is really a property of the space and is not only in tessellations, but in wallpaper. particular it is a an aspect that is of interest to people who study crystals because they have found out that if you look at the fine structure of crystals on the scale of the atoms that the atoms are arranged more or less in the same way they have the same properties of symmetry and repetition as uh, it is in these picture of the Alhambra. What Escher didn't like in these mosaics was these all these pieces of mosaic, well they didn't mean a thing to him. He wanted to make mosaics, tessellations, with figures that one could recognize as living figures. And this was really an old interest of him that started much more before this, because actually one of his first blocks is this one, in which you see 
also a repetition. You have to look a little carefully how many heads there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in total. Eight different heads, female and male, and looking up and looking down, and all fitting together. So, but his interest in structure, in fitting of patterns was, when you look at it, already present in his first work. If, for example, here, there is actually this pronounced interest in the tessellation of the cobblestones in the street and the roof and the houses and everything. So, for example, here you have one of his desolations and it is a very complicated one by the way. You see it has some sort of fourfold symmetry and the real symmetry right in the middle of the figure where you can turn this around and have one, two, three, four, when you look at this figure very carefully, you would say, oh, well, this is not the only fourfold rotation around this point. This is far more evident, these four points where these clamshells meet. But now there is a little trick here. Now, as far as shape goes, that is perfectly all right. But as far as design goes, it isn't, because a snail has a mouth and has a tip of its little house, and these are not the same. So actually, this shows that when you look very carefully, but it's a little hard to see, these are not real fourfold rotation points. They are only twofold. There's here another figure. This figure was discussed in a scientific magazine and the man who wrote the article said the black birds are the mirror image of the white birds and Escher was amused by this statement because it isn't true and you can see this because the white birds are optimistic their tails go upward the black birds are pessimistic their tails go downward Ma vediamo di esaminare un po' più in dettaglio quali sono le proprietà matematiche. But let's try to have a bit of a detailed look at the mathematical properties of some of Escher's mosaics. Here's one. Let's try and reconstruct the design and let's look at what this outline is with which we managed to generate the entire figure. Precisamente. To be precise, we start by noticing that if I turn this elementary structure around this point, I end up by reconstructing exactly the same design. And if I turn it once more, I end up with another piece of the design. Another thing I can do is to reflect around these axes and from this image get this other one that I didn't get by rotating previously, and so on. In other words, with respect to these points, I have a rotating symmetry of the third order. Using the rules of symmetry, in particular the groups of plane symmetry, Escher, thanks to his prodigious imagination, creates the various mosaics for which he is justly famous.
But Escher is not content to invade only the plane with his drawings. Here you see his figures detaching themselves from the plane to invade space, the third dimension. Naturally, Escher was also interested in solid geometric figures in space. Bruno Ernst tells us how Escher chose one of these in particular for a very precise purpose. Als Escher een opdracht aanvaarde, dan was het meestal uh, een teruggrijpen. When Escher accepted the commission, he always used a theme he had already used in his free work. This was quite common, of course. For the people who ordered something, preferred to have it à la mode d'Escher, that is to say, something of the ideas they knew from him. When, for example, the Verbriefe, which manufactured cans, etc., for the celebration of their 75th anniversary, ordered an Escher candy box, Escher used a motive that had always interested him. He tried out several possibilities of the regular platonic solids. The tetrahedron was too difficult to open. Was it possible to picture on it a regular tessellation with fishes? First he tried with this solid, then with the cube. That was possible. You see that he sketched some birds on it. But this was too simple. Not interesting. We can try with the other solid, the octahedron. Also here, there are many possibilities. A continuous stream of figures. We can also take the icosahedron, and this comes a little to life. You see that he sketched around it. And last, we have the dodecahedron. What was his final decision? Look for yourself at this row of models. Which would you choose as a candy box? I'll show you what Escher chose. It is this funny box, an icosahedron covered with seashells and starfishes. But it is a box. You can open it and put things in it. One can say that every artist is interested in the structure of the surrounding space. The Dutch artist Escher has analyzed in depth the geometric properties. Thank you. 
Here is an example illustrated by the mathematician Coxeter. Tetrahedron and the octahedron have uh, supplementary dihedral angles. If you put a tetrahedron on a face of the octahedron, you get the triangles of both in the same plane. And if you put another tetrahedron on the opposite face, and the whole figure then forms a rhombohedron which can fill space. So in fact, all space can be filled up with tetrahedra and octahedra fitted together like this. And that can be seen in Escher's picture of the flat worms, where a pair of tetrahedra and octahedra occur in many places. You can see this pattern being repeated over and over again in his picture. Of course, we're not only interested in the geometric space that we're accustomed to. We can also become interested in a space in which there are objects that seem to be impossible. Objects which one can perceive, but which are in fact impossible to construct. One of the first examples of impossible objects, and one of the first people to become aware of this phenomenon, was a crystallographer named Necker in 1832. The figure that he observed, today called Necker's cube, is this strange cube, a figure that one can draw but which one certainly can't construct in three-dimensional space. Because of its impossible geometry in three-dimensional space, we can amuse ourselves by creating variations of this impossible object. Physicist mathematician Penrose is very interested in the so called impossible structures. Well, I first came across the work of Escher when I was attending a congress of mathematicians in Amsterdam, in Holland. I was at that time a student of mathematics, and there was a special exhibition of the work of Escher that was in conjunction with an exhibition of Van Gogh's paintings but it was thought that the drawings and prints of Escher would be a special interest to mathematicians. And it was mentioned to me because it was known that I was interested in mathematical peculiarities, well, geometrical peculiarities, that uh, I might be interested in this uh, exhibition. And I went to see it, and I found it very quite fascinating. Particularly, I remember uh, the relativity and uh, night and day, I think, particularly stuck in my mind. And after seeing this, I went back, when I got back to England, I began to think, I wondered whether I could do something myself, which would be some kind of geometrical peculiarity, but perhaps not quite the same as the things I had seen at the 
exhibition of Escher. And uh, I then started to design pictures which were impossible in some sense. And gradually I simplified these until I designed this triangle of mine, which uh, is, it, well, it's the kind of thing which I mean an impossible object. Perhaps I can draw what this looks like. thing is that the triangle is, every small part of the figure is something which could exist as a three-dimensional object, but the whole configuration is something which could not exist three-dimensionally. I showed these things to my father, and he then designed a number of impossible figures himself. I remember particularly a, a drawing of a college which was an impossible building, and he then played with these for a while and gradually came across the staircase which uh, goes down all the way around. Now, when we both had these, when we had these two figures, the triangle and the staircase and several others, we then, this was round about in 1954 when the Mathematical Congress was in 1954, and uh, a little later than that, uh, perhaps next year, we wrote a paper which we sent to the British Journal of Psychology, which uh, contained a number of these drawings. And uh, when this was published, we sent a copy to Escher, and he then incorporated these into two of his own drawings. In the meantime, he had designed Belvedere, which used similar principles to the things we had. It was quite independent of the our own developments, uh, but the particular drawings, the triangle and the staircase, he incorporated into drawings of his own, or in, into uh, prints of his own, and here we have the staircase. This was developed specifically from the staircase that my father had designed. A little later, he incorporated the triangle of mine into th this waterfall picture where the water goes round and round in an impossible way. I should explain what we mean by an impossible object. We have here a drawing. Now, if you look at it, each corner of this triangle is itself represents a possible configuration. You could have two rods jointed in this way and uh, in three dimensions, and this would be a drawing of such a picture. If I cover up the rest of it, you can see that this one is, this corner is possible. Again, this corner represents a joint between two rods, quite perfectly all right. Again, this corner does. If I cover up only one corner, you can see, again, this is possible. The rod recedes into the distance as you go around. There is no incompatibility. Again, here, it's perfectly consistent. But if I uncover the whole picture, you find that as you go around, the distance appears to get further and further away, or the, in the opposite direction, you're getting closer to yourself, and, and it's inconsistent. So whereas the picture is, a, it's a possible drawing of a consistent configuration in each part itself, the whole thing is inconsistent. And you could not actually have an object which looks like this in three dimensions, which resembles this all the way around. On the other hand, it is possible to make a model which, because it, it's broken in one place, it, it does, when viewed from the right angle, it does, in fact, resemble such a thing. And my father made a number of models of impossible objects. The first one he made was the staircase. And this, if you view it from just the right angle, 
it, it will look like the staircase drawing. Now, but you see that it is broken, and you still you could not have an object which was consistently looked like that picture from every angle. But from exactly the right angle, it will look like like the impossible staircase. A little later, he made a model of the triangle. And this, again, if you look from just the right angle, it will resemble the picture that we just had of the triangle. But you'll notice that it's broken. You could not have an object which from every angle resembled the impossible triangle. It's not possible in three dimension, ordinary three-dimensional space to have such an object. the artist Escher goes beyond geometric impossibility and reaches imaginary fantasy. in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. That was one of the things that Hamlet said in the play. Escher, like Hamlet, was fascinated by the idea of infinity, trying to bound infinity in a nutshell. The pictures that he saw of mine gave him exactly that right flavor. And with that hint, he drew a picture called Circle Limit One. This was only a first attempt, and he was not very well satisfied with it. And he wanted me to tell him more about hyperbolic geometry, in which the points infinitely far away in the hyperbolic plane are thought of as being represented by a circle, and everything inside the circle is the hyperbolic world. The effect is then that shapes are represented truly, angles are represented without distortion, but distances become distorted. The closer one gets to the circumference, the greater is the distortion. So the points on the circumference are to be thought of as being infinitely far away. French mathematician Poincaré described a very clever model for this kind of geometry, and in that way 
he was able to see that all these black and white triangles are really the same size when they move further away, even though they don't seem to be. It's analogous to the situation on a sphere, where if this is a picture of the sphere, you see that the triangles in the middle seem to be larger than those near the circumference, but that is only perspective foreshortening. These on the sphere are all the same size. Similarly, in the hyperbolic plane, these triangles are to be thought of as being all the same size. And so it is when he made the green fish is going this way, the yellow fish is going this way, and so on. And this he found a very pleasing pattern, as indeed it is. And the symmetry of it is very interesting because, as a matter of fact, there are points of various kinds that be, can be distinguished in the figure. For instance, the points where two yellow fins and two green fins come together, and other points where four fins come together, are all arranged in a very symmetrical fashion. The point in the middle where two yellow and two green fins come together is not essentially different from other points, such as this where two green and two blue come together, and this where two blue and two yellow, and so on. Altogether, an octagon of such points. And each side of that octagon forms, with the center of the whole figure, a triangle which, from the hyperbolic standpoint, is equilateral. So Escher, in effect, saw how the hyperbolic plane could be tessellated with equilateral triangles meeting eight at each corner. infinity to finite terms is by the transformation called inversion. Inversion in a circle whereby a point outside the circle is transformed into a point inside so that it is on the same diameter but the distance from the center is the reciprocal of the distance to the original point. In this way if a point moves outside the circle, the inverse point moves inside, and even if the point moves infinitely far away, its image is still inside the circle. As the point moves farther and farther away, the image point gets closer and closer to the center. And so, if one considers the important curve called an equiangular spiral, which is a curve that goes round and round, going farther and farther from the center, or in the opposite direction, gets closer and closer to the center. That curve, inverted in a circle, say a circle in this position, will become a new kind of spiral with its pole at the inverse of the original pole, and then of course going the opposite way round. But the part that goes to infinity makes a second pole at the center. And so you have this curious effect of a curve that has two poles, and that is the curve which Escher used in his whirlpool.
cemetery of the town of Utrecht, the site of Escher's only fresco. Escher's world is the result of the encounter between the mathematical and scientific culture and imagination. Carré said, one theory of geometry is just more convenient than another. There's no doubt that by using different systems of geometry, Escher created fascinating effects. <laughs> <laughs> 